supposed to launch, so uh, now to, to start talking about it a little bit. Um, I, started, uh, I started building Pandas about six years ago. It was six years ago April. Um, so that, you know, I think about it like every April. It was like when I was 23, I was really frustrated with R and uh, uh, looking to build a, a, better, um, a better data environment for myself and then um, work to, to make that uh, a more relevant toolkit for, for the rest of the, the Python community. Uh, and I know that, uh, so, you know, many of you are, are active Pandas users and so certainly appreciate all the, all the support and, uh, and uh, using the library and helping, helping, make, it, helping make it better. Um, so I, um, it's been a, about almost two years since I finished it, but I, I did this book with, with O'Reilly to, to make the Python data stack uh, more, especially Pandas and tools related to Pandas and doing business analytics um, to make those tools more accessible uh, to a broad audience. And certainly the book has been a way, more, way more successful than I ever expected. Um, I have at least, I have three translations uh, at my home office and I think it's being translated into more languages, and I just, who knew that so many people wanted to, uh, wanted to learn about how to use these tools? Um, and I think part of that is, speaks to the strength of the ecosystem and the libraries uh, and all of the projects that, that make um, sort of doing data in Python uh, very attractive and, and important um, in sort of modern, modern uh, business and research. Um, so I founded this company, Datapad, last year. Um, we're, we're building a, a visual analytics tool, which I will uh, tell you some about and the technology, uh, technology that's under the hood. Um, talk just a little bit about, about the big picture of how I got from, I went from building an open source data project to building a business intelligence and, and analytics company. Um, so I was very interested in expanding, uh, improving tools in general and in particular, building tools that are, are focused on making people more productive and in getting, uh, just getting work done. And you know, at the end of the day, that's what I was frustrated about when I started building Pandas, was that I was, I, it was taking me a long time to do stuff. And uh, so I started building the library to make myself more productive and more effective in my work. Uh, and I've continued that theme uh, in all of my work, sort of looking at end user problems, like, like what, are the, what are the challenges? What are people spending a lot of time doing? What are the kinds of things that you wish you were spending less time doing? Um, and you know, really freeing you know, data scientists, you know, business analysts to be able to focus on the actual value add work, the reasons why they're there, rather than having to deal with some of the mundane um, issues of dealing with, dealing with data. Um, Pandas, of course, has been, been very successful at making uh, you know, day-to-day -day data wrangling, um, working with tab tabular data, um, you know, pretty, pretty easy to do. I deliberately built in a lot of flexibility uh, into the data structure so that they could be adapted to, to working with many different kinds of data. The same data frame object can be used to work with multi-dimensional multi -dimensional pivot tables. Um, and some of, the, some of the flexibility also makes the library less useful for hardcore data engineering. And every now and then I get an, uh, an email from somebody who's frustrated that Pandas isn't more like, isn't more like a database. Um, and I'm quick to remind them that I, that, was never, that was never the intent. Um, it was you know, uh, intended for, medium, for working with medium-sized data, um, which was actually part of many April Fool's Day jokes. Uh, I think Tableau published a thing. It's like, it's not about big data anymore. It's like medium data is really where it's at. Uh, I happen to agree, but I, I say that every day and not just on April Fool's Day. Uh, of course, people are using Pandas for all kinds of things. They're, you know, general data munging, people writing ETL jobs, uh, you know, uh, which you heard about in the last talk using, using Pandas. Um, but it's being used for a lot of um, business intelligence and business analytics. So I want to talk a little bit more about what is that, if you don't know what that is, and, uh, and sort of, you know, how I got to where I am now. So, Business intelligence is a pretty broad field, and uh, this is like my paraphrased you know, Wikipedia definition. Um, so it has to do with everything having to do with taking raw business data and turning it into something that you can use to run your business. And that might be making a decision about advertising spending or you know, who, you know, what, what parts of the business need more attention, what parts of the business are doing well, what parts aren't doing well. Um, there, might be, there might be prediction or statistics involved, forecasting any number of things. A lot of business intelligence is glorified, glorified counting, um, but it, you know, it goes from you know, very simple counting of things, often counting of very big things, 
um, to more sophisticated predictive analytics um, that is intended for uh, helping the business succeed. Um, so small data, big data, many different um, scales of data fall into, into the bucket that, that is um, in this day and age called, called business intelligence. Um, you may have heard of, heard of visual analytics, uh, so I wanted to give a, a bit more precise definition uh, of what this is. Uh, so when people say visual analytics, usually they're talking about tools that enable you to analyze data without a lot of coding. Um, and that might be some kind of you know, drag and drop type interface or maybe you know, a tabular interface where you, you, know, you, buy, you are able to analyze the data by uh, clicking or interacting with the data directly in some way. Um, many people, um, you know, I guess the, uh, if you've ever used Microsoft Excel and used the, uh, the pivot table builder, that's one example um, of a, of a visual, uh, visual analytics tool, um, albeit one that's quite simple. There's many successful products in this space, a um, product called Tableau, which has been around for about 10 years and went public last year, has been very, very successful. Of course, there's a list of you know, visual, analytics, visual analytics products that go down to the floor. Um, Spotfire, which is now owned by Tipco, uh, is another successful tool that offers some things that are a little different than, a little different than Tableau. Another thing I wanted to define, um, just for everyone's education, um, there's a sort of a new term in, in BI called, called data discovery, which is uh, a subset of, of BI that's um, focused on making, making the data highly interactive and explorable, and in particular, enabling connecting multiple data sources and being able to find insights that span across, span across multiple, uh, multiple sources. And I think that this, this term was, was born out of a need to describe a new class of tools um, that, that went outside of kind of the old school um, static, uh, static reporting from the, from the 70s and 80s, 70s and 80s and 90s, when the prospect of interactive data exploration just wasn't possible because of um, you know, the architecture of systems and RAM and you know, compute, the slowness of memory and CPUs uh, during those times. So, so the typical way that, um, you know, for the longest time, the way that people did, biz did business intelligence is they had some form of data warehouse or, or, or databases. Um, there's the concept of a data mart, which is like a temporary or an intermediate store for, uh, for views on a, an, on a much larger data warehouse or some way to provide like sandboxed access to, to analysts without them screwing up production data. Um, typically, they're, they're, um, the data warehouse, the database has, a, has an SQL interface. So you, inter you interface through it by writing uh, queries on, on tabular data. Um, there are so-called um, online analytical processing, I don't know if I got the acronym right, but uh, OLAP systems, which are um, oriented around building pre-aggregated views on, on data warehouses that can be sliced and diced very quickly. Um, and it's through the building of, of OLAP cubes that uh, many business analysts traditionally were able to do the sort of quick data exploration and, and data discovery work. Um, but there's, it came with caveats. Um, and of course, having some way to visualize and to build reports using the results of these systems. Um, some of the problems, and you know, I, I feel you know, I, I don't, I, I'm not as much of a BI expert as some of the people in the room, um, but uh, Often the traditional BI system, there's, there's a long implementation cycle involved. You have to get a lot of, it's typically very IT-led. Um, the building of the data warehouse, the building of the data cubes is something that, um, that the IT team is responsible for. So if you as an analyst, you have a, a bottleneck with other people in your organization for structuring and warehousing the data in a way that you can access it and you can actually do the, do the data analysis. Um, and this creates a lot of headache for, for analysts who are just trying to get access to the data, just trying to get access to the data, just trying to get work done. Um, and of course, implementation cycles can be very long, so it might be that you ask for some data to be placed in a certain way and made available to you, and you might get it in six months um, or, or longer. So, and this, is, this creates a bit, of, a bit of a conflict for, um, when you look at you know, how you know, with, with the growth of cloud businesses and, um, you know, really just if you're starting a company right now, like an e-commerce or consumer web company, um, ad tech company, some kind of a business that does, you know, 
that uses that uses cloud services and is growing very quickly. Maybe you know you're building off of venture capital or off of some you know bootstrap you know internet business model. You have to move really fast. You're making decisions on the order of days or or weeks and not not months months or years. Um, so it's it's more important than ever to to be able to access all of the data that you need you need to use to make to make decisions. Um, but unfortunately, as people are transferring responsibility for their data to other products and services in the interest of moving faster. Um, they're buying services to solve problems rather than, say, having all of their data and all of their applications in-house. And this creates data silos. Um, like you have data in Salesforce and in Google Analytics, and you run, you, know, you run your mailing list on MailChimp, and you need to be able to analyze like, who's signing up for, um, you know, to, buy, you know, to buy your product. So you have this problem, again, of like, the data is out there, it can be analyzed, but you have to do work to, to gather it um, in many cases to be able to, to get any, uh, in, any insights out of it. So, so this is the core problem that, that, that we have been thinking about. And um, I think that many of the people in the uh, Python data ecosystem um, honestly are, are I, I, you know, I won't generalize, but, but many Python data engineers and data scientists operate um, in this, this sort of data silo analytics hell where much of the, the Python code that we're writing is in the service of munging data, collecting data from places, integrating it with, with Pandas or with NumPy or with other tools, um, and doing either that sort of business analytics data exploration process in memory in Python you know, or in IPython notebooks um, or using other tools, you know, other tools in the ecosystem. So, so many like d data scientists and data engineers have become the bottlenecks for for data analysis within uh, within growing companies um, all over the world. So, so we've been thinking about building. So we've been working on building a system that that solves some of these problems. Um, that, so the core things are accessing and integrating data, um, being able to quickly. Um, do analysis on it, especially ad hoc analysis that you don't know what are the views on the data that you're going to be building before you start looking at the data. And the last part is collaboration and being able to quickly take data that you have and put it in front of somebody else in a way that is useful and, and that they can, they can analyze it themselves. Um, turns out this is really hard. So uh, it, 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 takes, it takes a lot of work. Um, so we've been We've been building a system that, um, that has a lot of components, but at a high level, you have you know, users working, working with a product. Um, they connect to all of their data sources, and then we build a system that is able to ingest all of that data from many different products and services, um, and then provide tools to collaborate on that data, to integrate and refine it, and to do analytics and produce um, visualizations and pivot tables and the kinds of things that they would need to, to share to, for others to consume insights. So this is a lot of stuff to build, obviously. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some of those core problems and how, how we're leveraging tools in, in the Python ecosystem and have built tools internally uh, to solve some of these problems. So the, uh, I would say that the, you know, we have two, two hard problems. The first is the front end problem of building a productive and useful an intuitive user interface, um, and secondly, actually making the making the data exploration process uh, as fast as fast as possible, and in doing it in a way that we can provide a service that isn't prohibitively expensive. So, balancing all of those things has not has certainly not not been easy. Um, so, let me just uh, jump into a demo to give give you a little bit of a more concrete view of. Uh, of what's going on um, in Datapad land. So this is an example of, of, of a dashboard that we built. And if you've read my book, you probably know this data. It's the, uh, all of the individual campaign contributions from the 2012 uh, presidential election. Um, so I produced a set of, a set of visualizations. Um, I asked for the video of this, uh, this talk to not be published for a few weeks since we're very close to launch and uh, still having people sign NDAs, so I hope you don't, hope you don't mind. Um, so the things that we're looking at here, I have, um, these are weekly, so we, weekly aggregating this time series data, so um, 
weekly donations, total donations by candidates, so just for the top two candidates. Um, this bottom left chart is a histogram, um, is a histogram by, by donation size, and then the total donated within each bucket. So if you look at this long bar over here, is people who donated the individual maximum in the, in the election, which is $2,500. And then over here you have donations from um, grassroots donors, people who donated between zero and $25. You see there's a big spike at $1,000. Some people just donated $1,000 to a candidate. Um, then over here, these are the 20 most frequently occurring states in the data set and the amount, total amount donated within those, within those states. And so something that we might want to do here is look at characteristics of uh, people who donated um, the individual maximum. So I can, on that chart, select um, and filter those large donations. And if I'm connected to the internet, I think there's like a golden rule that demos never work. Um, so let's see here. OK, so I, let me try that again. Just, just try that one more time. OK, so I select and filter on the large donations, and you see that it splits and is now heavily weighted toward, um, toward Republican donors um, during those time periods. Um, and if I pan over to the um, small donations and let that go, then that re-aggregates all, all of the charts um, given the, the selection on the small donations. And I could further break that down. Um, let's see here, I could just, I could look at the large donations and then only look at California and New York. And if you select limit by, if you look at just liberal states, the rich person effect goes away a little bit. Um, but we could do kind of ad hoc exploration, maybe um, filter by city. And let's say we're interested in um, the city of Portland, and then maybe um, occupations, and let's say select uh, teachers. And so you could see, you know, here were the donations by, you know, teachers in Portland, um, and maybe who donated less than $1,000. Um, and so this is like not big data, but it's five million rows of data, and being able to very quickly um, sort of filter and re-aggregate this data. Um, there are some bugs. You know, it takes a lot of engineering work. So, so that's been fun. So, so one of the solutions that we, that, that we came up with for for, for being able to do this kind of quick, quick exploration, and also for you to be able to quickly um, sort of filter and explore, explore the data regardless of how, where the data is coming from. Because what you don't want to happen is for, you, you buy a product like this, um, that you have to go and buy a new database to actually make the product useful, which is what's happening in a lot of cases. Um, so the, all of our analytics are happening against um, all of the data is, is materialized as a view on the underlying data sources in a, in a columnar data store. And we're doing all of the analytics inside our walls using the same um, in-memory query processor. And we're doing all of the joins and integrations between data uh, within, within our walls. So in a little more technical detail about you know, what are these queries, I talk about queries, like what are, what are those things? So if you look back at... Um, at this dashboard. So um, each of these charts is the result, is, is the, the visualization of the results of a query. And so in the top chart, um, the querying is, uh, includes um, candidate and um, time, but time aggregated at weekly frequency. This chart down here is a histogram, so the dimensions are um, donation amount, but Binned with bin, bins of width 25, um, and this and the st in the state the only dimension is state, and then for each of them I'm computing a single metric, namely the sum of contributions. So you can generalize and think about, uh, you know, what I'll call a BI query um, as being a list of a list of dimensions, which are how you group and how you group the data for aggregation. So if you're using pandas, this would be the stuff that you pass into the group by function. Um, measures are the things that you aggregate, the, you know, the aggregations that you perform, and so the numbers that you produce that are, you know, computed for each group in the data. Uh, and additionally, there, there are filters, which is um, what, what subset of the data do you want to include in the query? 
And there's other things that you have to think about. Uh, if you have a dimension that has 100,000 or a million distinct values, you might want to limit your analysis to the interesting portion of the data, which might only include uh, the 10 or 20 most frequently occurring values in the data set. So there's an additional complexity here in building a user interface for doing this kind of work is that you have to, in the user interface, you have to establish a way to build a query which just tells, um, tells a database system how to aggregate the data and then taking the results of that, of that aggregation, how to map that on to a, onto a data visualization. So I'm going to show you something that is very, uh, is still very, uh, very beta, but uh, so this is a pretty famous data, uh, data set for data visualization, the so-called uh, so diamonds data set. So if you're an R uh, ggplot2 fan, you will know this data set. Um, but uh, so this is, so this is a, an example of a visual analytics, visual analytics interface, um, all of my which is inside, you know, will be shipped in Datapad. Um, these are all of my fields in the data, whether they're, it shows the type, whether they're a number or a category. Um, I have no dates in this data set. Um, but I could choose a category, and if I drag that category to, uh, to the X field um, in the interface, I can choose whether to aggregate that category or to use it as a dimension. If I use it as a dimension, it chooses to uh, a default metric, which is the number of rows for each uh, distinct value of, of clarity. Um, but because I dragged the category to X, it infers that the right default visualization is a vertical bar chart with the categories laid out on the X axis. But if I select horizontal bars as the chart type, I get a horizontal bar chart but now it's moved the dimension to Y because now the categories are laid out on the Y axis. But I could choose another category in Y and now get a grouped bar plot uh, or drag that category to X and get a stacked bar plot. Or I could drag the category to trellis and get subplots for each of the distinct values of, of cut. So what's going on under the hood, and if you've used um, something, like, something like Tableau or another BI tool, you, you're already, probably already familiar with this, this style of, of data analysis, um, is that there's an implicit mapping between the metrics that you have here. So I could change this to be, say, average price. Um, looks like that didn't work. So what's the golden rule of demos that they never work? Um, so if I, change the, if I change the metric here, what's going out to the, um, to the back end system is this list of dimensions and any, any additional information I could say limit to the top four clarities in the data set and that updates now I have only the four most frequently occurring clarities. Um, so this is building a query which is going into a database system and then that is being mapped onto a visualization. Um, and it's highly informed by the um, by the types of dimensions involved. So if I have a number dimension and a category dimension, I can turn that into a box plot or a grid of box plots. So it takes a lot of the drudgery out of doing very simple data analysis. But it can get a lot more complex. I was gonna do a coding demo, but uh, I think I'm gonna run out of time, so. Um, you can do all of this work in, in, in Python, of course, but it takes a lot more, takes a lot more coding. Um, so I wanted to, to talk a little bit in more technical detail about uh, what's going on under the hood, um, what tools are we using, um, why did we build a, why did we build a, our own query processor, which seemed kind of insane a year ago, but um, is seeming less insane, less insane now because it actually works and, uh, uh, it always seems a little crazy when you're building something and people are saying, why are you building that? And uh, you're like, well, it's going to be great once it's done. Uh, and it's not, you know, no one actually believes you until it's done. Um, so we designed, we, we designed a, an analytic system from the ground up to serve um, the needs of, this, needs of this application. It was heavily informed by experience building pandas, things about pandas that worked well, both from a features point of view 
um, the ability to express complex, um, complex data aggregations, and, and also, because um, I, you know, I was a database programmer in my past life in, in finance, um, did a mix of Python and you know, working on Pandas, but also wrote you know, prodigious amounts of SQL. Um, and there are a lot of things about SQL that make it not the best for doing analytics. Um, but yet, you know, we have kind of you know, analysts across, across the world um, doing huge amounts of analytics in SQL, which was not really designed for doing data analysis, but more for, for data warehousing and, and manipulating, uh, manipulating tabular data. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about this. Um, other parts of the stack outside of the, of the analytics engine, um, there's a distributed system that does query routing and load balancing. Um, so most of the time when you're using the system, all of your queries are going to the same machine in AWS, where, which probably has a lot of your data already in memory. Maybe some of that data is on disk. Um, but it, it essentially has a hot cache of the data that you're working with at that particular point in time. Um, we're, we're dealing with communications between client and server using, using WebSockets, which is the same protocol that the IPython notebook uses. And um, I think, honestly, the IPython notebook made everybody a lot more comfortable with WebSockets. I know that, personally, like going into building a web application, and especially one that's highly interactive and low latency, um, I would have been much more afraid um, about doing so with, without the IPython notebook, which established it as a, as a, safe, thing, a safe thing to do. Um, there's Gevent on the back end for you know, concurrency and, and for managing the, the WebSocket, WebSocket connections. Um, we build a uh, tabular data store. So it's not Pandas, but um, it's, it's very similar to, to how Pandas uh, stores data in memory, but uh, compressed format on disk. Um, many reasons why we build a custom format. Um, I guess the biggest one is that uh, if anyone's familiar with columnar data formats, uh, the Parquet format was not quite mature enough um, for us to implement uh, a year ago, as far as I know. And, the, and outside of that, it's just getting data into the system, building data connectors to all of the, all of the services that, that people use. Um, so if you, look at, if you look at the Pandas code base, and I don't know how much you've spent reading the code base, it kind of breaks down into um, you have the, the data frame and the data structures themselves that you work with, and that's like the, a so there's the API layer. It's like how the code that you write and how you're describing computation on data. But if you dig down beneath the surface of data frame uh, underneath series, you'll see that really there's, you know, there's a, there's a tabular, so there's a table data structure, and if you look at how group by is implemented and how all of the analytics that, that Pandas does are implemented, um, really there's, there's just a lot of kernels of um, counting things, categorizing things, grouping things, filtering things. Um, everything kind of falls into various buckets of, of simple um, algorithms and, and analytics, I call them analytics kernels, which are assembled to produce a more complex, you know, we group the data, we filter it, we aggregate it. Um, and then we present it to the user in a certain way. So we kind of rebuilt that from the ground up um, with the Badger system. Um, I've become more of a C programmer since, since working on it, and a lot of the code is now in a, in a shared library affectionately known as libbadger, um, and that forms the, the, heart of the heart of the query engine. So, so if you use Datapad after we, after we launch, you know, you'll know whenever you're interacting with the system that it's sort of going directly into you know, piles of, of, of fun C code that, that I've been, you know, sort of working on with my team over the last year. Um, so the front end stack, uh, we're big fans of AngularJS. I don't know if anyone is an Angular programmer in the, uh, um, in the crowd, but um, really great for building uh, these types of responsive and interactive applications. I think React, uh, ReactJS didn't exist um, a year ago. We might have considered, uh, considered using that if, if Facebook had, had open sourced it open sourced it sooner, um, using D3 for all the visualizations, but uh, a lot of the, we've built our, a lot of our own visualizations just because um, needing to have tight control over, you know, how the data is represented in the back end, how it's represented in the front end, and how we're rendering it for the, for the user. And there is a sort of, I guess I call it pandas.js, because it turns out that there's no good data frames for JavaScript. and. Uh, so I think I'm, I'm just going to become the guy that like goes to a new language and it's like, well, there's no data frames yet, so uh, I'm just going to I'm just going to build them now because I don't know how to function without 
without a data frame. That, that, that held true with JavaScript. Um, not having integers is, is, turns out to be a big problem. Uh, so, nine minutes left, huh? I really talked fast. So one of the things that I had wanted to do, and it looks like maybe, and I have time for it, um, to sort of go through that and go through that FEC data set a little bit in a little bit in pandas and reproduce some of the um, a couple of the things that I, I did um, inside the sort of inside the visual um, datapad interface. So my memory of pandas is atrophying, so this is going to be a lot of fun. So if we look at the donation, the, the do donation amount column in the data set, so we'll save that into the amount variable, make this a little bigger. So if you use pandas in your day-to-day -day work, you're probably familiar with the, um, with the cut and the queue cut functions. So cut, uh, let's see, pandas.cut, and if I pass amount, So if you recall the cut function, um, I can pass a number of bins, and um, it will split the, split the data set into to that number of bins um, in linear increments. So if I use pandas.cut and say I want 100 bins, I'm so close up against my memory limit on this machine that I'm going to close, close some windows. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I might have chanced fate by, uh, by loading such a large data set into, uh, into memory on this, uh, on this machine. Uh, I actually am going to open it up to questions and sort of skip, uh, skip live coding in front of uh, such a large, a large audience. Uh, so I figure there's plenty of things that the folks in the audience would, would, like, to ask, uh, would like to ask about, um, whether it's you know, related to my current, current endeavors or um, anything related to Pandas or the PyData stack or you know, sort of my thoughts on uh, life, the universe, and everything. Um, yeah. Thank you. So you've shown some graphics over there, some nice plots, but um, are you allowing the user to actually, with your system, to go into the data itself, like pivoting uh, spreadsheets or with the same data structures? Uh, is it something that you plan to do? Yeah, so we, we do have the ability to do, um, to, to do pivot tables. So you know, in this particular, you know, this is kind of an old, uh, an old user interface, but uh, so you know, I can build um, build a pivot table, and say select, you know, I don't know, twenty most frequently occurring states broken down by by candidate, and maybe adding you know total donations followed by you know median donation sizes for those groups. Um, so you can do pivot tables. Um, essentially, you know, charts are one visual representation um, of a pivot table. Uh, if you you know if you kind of think about the world like that. Um, so the features that we've that we've really focused on have been um, have been sort of dimension and metric based data aggregation, and then enabling you to sort of um, either drive the analysis using visualizations or pivot tables, um, or just kind of you know just interact with that data in a, new, a number of different ways. Um, there's also the ability to to edit the data directly within the application without writing any code, which um, solves a pretty big pain point that you need to do relatively small transformations of the data. You need to remove you know, limit values to a certain range or rename, combine fine-grained categories into coarser-grained categories. 
um, define new variables, you know, essentially something like Excel, Excel formulas, but being able to do it in the, inside this interface and have it apply to the whole, to the whole data set. So, but uh, we're a tiny company, and uh, you know, just we have not yet launched. So there'll, there'll be a lot more features in that in that direction. Uh, if we want to use this product, but we have some like uh, sensitive data, like HIPAA data, how do we do it? Uh, so, so we're focused on a we're focused on a cloud on a cloud offering right now. Um, I guess it's something we could talk about, you know, talk about after the after the talk. But um, at some point in the future, we intend to offer offer the application to be to be run standalone. Um, I don't know when. I can't make any promises. But um, right now, we're focused on having a service that is very easy for for businesses to pick up and start using without a lot of uh, administration costs. Are you able to handle um, analytic functions like uh, defining a partition and looking at first and last things within there? Uh, in some cases, um, so we have we have uh, quant quantile uh, sort of quantile binning um, and a number of sort of analytics, which can be things like count distinct, first to last, um, sort of like an expanding set of functions. We're kind of just uh, people ask us for things and then we build them. But part of part of building a a custom, um, a custom sort of data engine was being able to quickly respond to user requests, like adding new kinds of uh, kinds of analytics. I think some some companies choose to, to build their system um, using off-the-shelf technology, and that places constraints because you often aren't able to customize um, customize the sort of ex the you know open source tool or sort of other system that you're using to do the do the data processing. Hi, is there a difference um, in the interface for the data scientists or dashboard developer versus the interface for the end user of the dashboards? You know how in Tableau we have desktop version and the web server. So for us, there's no there's no distinction between desktop and web. It's like you can you know you can use it on your iPad, you can use it in the browser. It's it's you know the same interface everywhere. We are talking about like a pro like a pro mode that. Ha offers like a scripting interface for uh, for data scientists or you know Python or R programmers to be able to insert and custom analytics, but that's sort of on the roadmap. And I think we would need more more data about what people need before we build that. Um, we we do plan to offer an API to push and pull data, so to use the product as like a way to publish and make data accessible to other people. Especially if you're in an IPython notebook, you have a data frame, you want to sort of and you want to like immediately send, you know put that data in front of somebody else and for them to get an email saying, like, here's a new data set for you to play with, and you could use the product as, as a means to do that. Yeah. That's my over there. Oh, you have the ability to mash up different data sets or different sources? Yeah, so you, you, can, you, can, do, you, can, join, you can join data sets inside the application. Um, we'd like to provide more help, more uh, assistance in doing that, rather than having to sit and figure out which are the... Uh, the keys to join the data sets on, um, but all of the all of the joining and integration happens inside the inside the application. Um, <clears throat> what ability is there to process data in real time or somewhat real time as it's coming into the servers or the databases? Uh, right now, it's a it's a it's a poll it's a poll model. So you um, you define the view the you know the view of interest and this frequency that you want to update it. And it might be that you want to update it once an hour or every five minutes or, or once a day. Um, we're really interested in streaming data support and being able to push for you as a developer to push data into the system or to attach to a real-time real -time API. But uh, it, hasn't, it hasn't been a priority while we've been sort of getting an MVP ready to, ready to ship. Um, hey, uh, are you planning on making the visualization types extendable at all? How do you mean extendable, like, uh, like cu mean, custom D3 code or? Uh, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. We've talked about it. Uh, the um, one thing that would make it easier is if we if we published our, which I'm not sure if we'll do or not, but if we published our our sort of JavaScript data frame library, which would enable it essentially would be easier to build custom visualizations that 
understand those data structures, in which case it would, it would expect a you know, pandas.js data, data table object, and it would make a D3 visualization, and you could drop that in to Datapad uh, relatively easily. So something we're thinking about, but um, because the tool is not is, is designed for business analysts who are not who are not um, JavaScript programmers, it hasn't been um, it's designed designed to be useful by them. So we, we haven't been prioritizing features that are uh, that require a lot of deep programming skills. Alrighty, well, thanks everybody for. Uh, Coming to the talk.